All right, thank you very much, George. Uh, welcome, everybody. In this talk, I'm going to try to explain what the current situation is with uh, the government and UFOs. I'm also going to try to explain the history leading up to this situation and discuss a few of the people involved and the evidentiary basis for their claims. And I'll try to explain a little bit about what's actually going on and what's likely to happen next. And I'll try to do this in about uh, 25 minutes so we can all get to lunch. Uh, so, how did we get from the government ignoring UFOs and the media making fun of them to the current situation of congressional hearings, the Pentagon UFO task force, a NASA investigation, UFO whistleblowers, and an increasingly credulous media? Uh, first of all, a word of warning. This is a very difficult topic to summarize. It's very, very complicated. It's a long story uh, with a lot of history going back to the 1940s. There's a huge cast of characters. Uh, the institutions involved are themselves very complicated. They're big and slow moving. It's a current topic. Just yesterday, there was a uh, congressional briefing on the topic. Nothing. People were very excited about this. Nothing really came of it, but uh, it's still very much ongoing. And it's a topic that has escaped journalistic scrutiny by being too weird to scrutinize. There's a lot of baggage that comes along with UFOs. We know people make fun of UFOs, and rightly so in, in some, at some point. Um, this is changing somewhat, but most academics and most journalists still find the topic all rather silly, as I'm sure a lot of people here do too. Speaking of cast of characters, this is a these are the people that I will mention in this talk. Uh, ufology, as you can see, is a very, is a very male-dominated subject, and uh, I think that speaks to how much of a, a niche subject it is, but that's kind of a topic for another time. These are the men who populate the story of how we got here. And to understand how we got here, we need to understand a little bit more about where we actually are. Uh, first of all, there is Arrow. Arrow is the official DOD organization that's investigating UFO cases. There's the NASA investigation. Uh, there's been several congressional hearings. And one of those hearings had a UFO whistleblower making some quite extraordinary claims. And there's a surprising amount of UFO-related legislation. First, first of all, we have Arrow. Arrow is the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. He went through a number of uh, name changes. The last one was actually AIMSOG, A-O-I-M-S-G. And quite rightly, they changed it to something more pronounceable. It's uh, headed by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, um, a DOD scientist. And it's very much an official DOD office, uh, reporting directly to the, Secretary, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks. Uh, it has 40 employees. And it has a budget in the tens of millions of dollars. And they've said several times that there's no evidence of ET. But no one believes them. Uh, earlier this month, Arrow released their second annual report on UFOs. They listed 801 different UFO, or UAP, as they call it now, UAP uh, encounters or uh, sightings. None of them were uh, underwater or in space, which is something people have been getting excited about, this thing about uh, trans-domain, uh, cross-domain uh, UFOs. None of them were listed as a threat which is interesting because people say that UFOs are you know, possibly a problem. And they said that most UFOs will likely resolve to ordinary phenomena. They also said that many reports are probably the result of sensor artifacts, equipment error, misidentification, and misperception. But, this is what got everybody excited, a very small percentage of UAP reports display interesting signatures, basically saying they're doing something that humans wouldn't be doing. NASA, much to the dismay of many scientists, including some on the panel itself, uh, formed a panel to study UFOs. This panel was formed uh, back in October of last year, and they gave themselves a year to come up with a report. And this report actually came out a few weeks ago. It's not very interesting. And uh, they had this presentation to discuss it. The report and the presentation is mostly about uh, technical stuff. How do you gather data? How do you collate radar? How do you gather reports from different people? And how do you, um, how do you calibrate the instruments so this all works? But they did say also, like Arrow, that there was no evidence of, of UFOs. Uh, there's been three congressional hearings. This is Senate or Congress 
the House uh, hearings on UAPs. Uh, in, back in May 2022, there was a public hearing, a congressional hearing of the House Intelligence Committee, where the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security at the Pentagon and the Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence both testified about what the government's doing with UFO research. In April this year, Arrowhead Sean Kirkpatrick testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee. This was not a very well-attended meeting. Uh, and most recently, the, the House Committee on Oversight and Accountability held a hearing, and this might be one you might have be familiar with, uh, where military personnel testified about their experience with UFOs and UFO investigations. There were two pilots there, and the guy in the middle is uh, a guy called David Grush. David Grush is a Pentagon employee who tried to blow the whistle on UFOs. And he's made a, a remarkable series of claims. He claimed that uh, alien craft were retrieved. We've actually retrieved actual alien craft. That those craft contains what he called non-human biologics, which basically means alien bodies, or perhaps bits of aliens smeared over the walls or something like that. <laughs> uh, he claims there was a secret illegal program of reverse engineering, and there's a giant cover-up, which is being going on back to the 1940s, and it involves the Vatican. Apparently, the Vatican, <laughs> the Vatican actually helped the, the OSS back in the 1940s smuggle a giant UFO out of Italy. Or at least uh, so people told him. Uh, none of this stuff is actually things that he's seen with his own eyes. These are things that people have relayed to him or showed him documents. He believes it to be true, and he's trying to blow the whistle. So this is uh, one of the big things in UFOlogy right now. The legislation, there are several pieces of existing legislation. The most recent one is still pending. It's the uh, UAP Disclosure Act of 2023. And uh, there it is. It's uh, sponsored by Chuck Schumer and a bunch of other people like Marco Rubio. It's got, authorizes $20 million a year for studying uh, UFOs. And it mentions the words non-human intelligence 22 times. Uh, and this is something that might actually become law. It's part of a big omnibus bill. Sometimes things get removed, but it may well become law. But either way, though, it shows that the government is taking this subject, or at least some people are taking this subject, very seriously. Excuse me. Um, so how did we get into this serious situation? What events led us up to these things? Where did it start? Uh, there's a variety of possible starting points with the story of ufology, and you're probably familiar with some of them. There's the Kenneth Arnold was the first person to see a UFO back in 1947. 1947 was also uh, the Roswell incident, where the, the government or the military initially claimed they'd find a flying saucer, changed their story to be a, uh, a weather balloon. Uh, there's previous government investigations like Project Blue Book in the 1950s and 60s, but yeah, don't really have time for all that. I'm going to uh, start with the people more directly involved, and I'm going to start with uh, Jacques Vallée. Jacques Vallée is one of the world's most famous UFO researchers. There's a character in Close Encounters of the Third Kind based on Jacques Vallée. Uh, he wrote a book called The Invisible College about an informal network of researchers who work on the UFO issue behind the scenes to avoid the stigma that exists in academia and media. Uh, some of these people who work behind the scenes are more public now. Here's uh, some of the people. There's Hal Putoff, an old school researcher into a variety of topics. Some of you uh, may remember him as a supporter of Yuri Geller. Uh, and he actually believed that Yuri Geller could bend spoons. There's Gary Nolan, a Stanford biologist who works with Jacques Vallée. Uh, you might remember Gary Nolan from an article I wrote in Skeptical Inquirer about hairdryer burns. He worked on that uh, particular case uh, with, uh, with Jack Vallée. This is where people who thought they were abducted by aliens also had burns that resembled burns from hairdryers. Strange little story. And then there's a local guy, George Knapp. He's a journalist from here in Las Vegas who has been deeply involved in the UFO scene for many years. Another local connection is Robert Bigelow. Robert Bigelow is a billionaire with an interest in the supernaturals and in UFOs. Uh, he lives in Las Vegas. Inspired by the ideas of uh, Jacques Vallée and others, in 1995, 
he started a paranormal investigation organization called NIDS. NIDS was staffed with a bunch of alternative scientists like uh, Hal Putoff and another guy called Colm Kelleher who was a, a biochemist who was an expert in cattle mutilations. In 1996, NIDS set up shop in Skinwalker Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch is a supposedly supernatural ranch that was just acquired by Robert Bigelow specifically for this purpose. At Skinwalker Ranch, NIDS looked into things like UFOs, transdimensional portals, cattle mutilations, and poltergeists. Uh, they didn't really find very much. But that program was run by Colm Kelleher, the uh, cattle mutilation guy, and at some point involved this guy, Jay Stratton, who actually worked at the Pentagon. Also in 1996, a crucial introduction was made in the scene by George Knapp. George Knapp took Nevada Senator Harry Reid to a NIDS meeting. And then Reid, by his own account, which is in the New York Times, he wrote an article in the New York Times, was fascinated by people like uh, Valet and Putoff and became a supporter of Robert Bigelow. Now, skipping forward a bit, because it's a long story, in 2005, George Knapp and Colm Kelleher wrote a book about Skinwalker Ranch. This was read by a Pentagon scientist called James Lakatsky, who also got fascinated by the supernatural tales. Lakatsky visited the ranch. He had a supernatural vision in the kitchen of the ranch where he saw what he described as uh, the cover of Mike Oldfield's tubular bells floating in front of him. He decided, based on this vision, that this ranch was worth studying. So, George Knapp facilitated a meeting with uh, Robert Bigelow and Harry Reid. Harry Reid arranged legislation to create a group uh, financed by public money run out of the Pentagon called ORSAP. This was in, again, 2005. Supposedly, the uh, group was meant to study the future of aviation. This is kind of what it said on the box. This is what uh, the description of the group actually was. But unfortunately, the actual intent of the group was to study supernaturals and UFOs at Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, supposedly also out for open tender, the contract went to Robert Bigelow. And essentially, NIDS, Robert Bigelow's organization, was transformed into a government-funded program, uh, including our friend Jay Stratton, who you'll see more of later. Okay, so ORSAP, what's ORSAP? ORSAP is the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program. Uh, they, you know, they were studying all kinds of weird things at Skinwalker Ranch. And it ran from 2008 to 2012, and at some point uh, within that, a separate group was, call, was formed called ATIP, which you may have heard of. ATIP had more of a focus on UFOs, but exactly what he did is unclear and somewhat contested. Fast forward a bit more to 2017. This was the big turning point in ufology. Uh, all of a sudden we get a story about all of this in the New York Times. This story gets a lot of attention. Now many of you will remember this, except you know, this story that they wrote isn't actually the real story. They don't mention the origin of Skinwalker Ranch of the ATIP program. They don't even mention ORSAP at all. They focus entirely upon, uh, upon UFOs. They don't mention the supernatural research, they don't mention the cattle mutilations, they don't mention the poltergeist. But all this was in fact part of uh, the program. Instead they just focus on the U UFO hunting. They do introduce this guy, Luis Elizondo, who claims to have run it, although that's also disputed. And along with him there was uh, Jay Stratton, who many people think was the actual guy behind all of this. At the exact same time, same time excuse me, in December 2017, Tom DeLong, appears on the scene. He's a very unlikely member of the Invisible College. He is the front man of the rock group Blink-182. Uh, he has long been fascinated by UFOs and has many connections in the UFO scene. He started an organization called the To The Stars Academy, which originally was going to build a spaceship based on UFO technology, but they didn't. Uh, some of the founding members were Lou Elizondo, Hal Putoff, and a new guy, Chris Mellon. Chris Mellon was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence during the Clinton and Bush administrations. His job was to lobby Congress and, what, and write UFO legislation for them. He was very good at this. Uh, congressional interest is driven by public interest, and by 2020, Mellon's efforts led to the UAP Task Force, a new government body 
for studying UFOs. And this UAP task force was headed by Jay Stratton from OSAP and Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, the, in 2021, the UAPTF, uh, Stratton's organization, did a report, said they could only solve one case from 144, which is a terrible record. Uh, in 2022, they were replaced by Arrow. Arrow, the old domain anomaly resolution office, Pentagon's new thing. Stratton leaves, goes to work in private industry, and Stratton now appears on TV. Uh, he actually, uh, appear, you can see him on the History Channel sometimes, on a show called The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. 2023, now Arrow is solving cases, but uh, there's no evidence of aliens. So the obvious question here is why? Uh, why is the Pentagon doing it? Well, you know, the Pentagon is doing it because it's law. Uh, because Congress told them to, not because they think it's a great idea. You know, why is Congress passing legislation? There's a couple of reasons why they might actually go along with this. Uh, if, first of all, like if, if a pilot can't identify something, then it's a good idea to try to figure out why that is. Is it an illusion? Is it actually something real? And secondly, what if the UFOs are foreign adversary technology like this Chinese drone? We need to detect them, maybe capture them and reverse engineer them. Uh, why is NASA studying it? Well, you know, they're doing it because Bill Nelson said so. Uh, Bill Nelson is the, the head of NASA, uh, and uh, he personally decided that we need to look into UFOs because he got convinced by all this, this stuff that's been floating around, and so he commissioned this board. The people on the, on the panel, they're not really into aliens. Uh, NASA's not really looking for aliens. They've been given a job uh, and are carrying it out. There's some good science they can do, and they might be able to help with some of the real issues. But the real issues are not what the invisible college are interested in, although they do use them as an excuse. The invisible college actually thinks that UFOs are alien craft, and they think that humanity deserves to know the truth about our place in the universe alongside uh, these visiting non-human entities or aliens. And you see this especially in the new legislation, uh, which mentions non-human uh, uh, intelligence 22 times, and the author of that legislation, Chris Mellon, uh, very much believes in this, this hypothesis. He said, quite explicitly, non-human origin is presently the theory that best fits the facts. Yeah, so you know, the guy writing this legislation basically believes the aliens are visiting us. Uh, now, the acceptance of ET by them should not be surprising when you consider the origin of the modern movements with NIDS and uh, Skinwalker Ranch, but They've carefully tried to stay away from this. Uh, they've tried to, tried to stay away from the woo, try away from the super, stay away from the supernatural. Even though a lot of them believe in it, they know other people will not. Gary Nolan uh, said quite, quite uh, emphatically that uh, we all know uh, that the woo is just around the corner. Uh, he said, like, we stay away from the woo. Uh, everybody involved knows it's not just nuts and bolts, and we're careful not dancing too far over the line because it will scare the bejesus out of people if it gets too deep into the woo. And yet all of us know the woo is just around the corner. So invisible college people not only think it's aliens, they also think there's kind of weird supernatural stuff going on. Uh, so what's the evidence behind this? Well, there's two types of evidence that, that uh, supports this UFOs are aliens hypothesis. The first one is testimony. And uh, that's both first-hand and second-hand. People are honestly relating uh, things that they think they have seen or experienced or something, things that people have told them. We, but we now all know, you know, we're very familiar with skeptics, that eyewitness testimony is not very reliable, memory is not very reliable, people make mistakes. Uh, and if, if that's all we had, just this testimony, it probably wouldn't be enough. So, but we also have data. And in the most pervasive form of data, the most persuasive form of data, is videos of actual UFOs. Uh, these videos look like great evidence. Uh, every single one of those videos has been identified, uh, authenticated by the Department of Defense as being an actual unidentified something, or at least it was at some point. But also, every single one of these videos has a mundane explanation, and sometimes a definitive mundane explanation. Real quick, the one in the uh, top left is, looks like a, something flying around an airport. It actually seems to be a pair of wedding lanterns, and the apparent motion is from parallax. There's a plane flying around it. It makes it seem like it's moving. Second one, very famous, 
uh, video. It's the, uh, the gimbal video. It looks like a rotating flying saucer, but it's probably just the glare of a distant engine and it's rotating because of the camera. Go fast, analyze it, it's actually going slow. The fourth one there is a famous Tic Tac video. Doesn't actually look like a Tic Tac. The green triangle down in the corner there, in the bottom middle right, middle left, uh, is, uh, was originally thought to be a flying triangular craft with other flying triangles behind it. And then they eventually discovered it was just the camera was out of focus and because the camera had a triangular aperture, it made it uh, look into little triangles. And the, the flying craft in the background are actually just stars. You can actually align the, the constellations. The more recent one released by Arrow is this Middle East Sphere. This was recently analyzed by a, an organization called Bellingcat who does geolocation and they discovered it was probably just a balloon. They, they analyzed the motion. Uh, the next one was supposedly a drone, but it actually looks uh, much more like a plane. You can actually see the tail and the, the heat signature of the engines. This is a moving uh, UFO. It looks like it's moving left and right, but again, it's just the, the camera moving. Down the bottom left, there's a UFO chasing a plane. Analyze that one, it's actually just a bird that's a lot closer to the camera. You can see the wings flapping and it's moving in a sinusoidal path. Uh, this middle bottom one here was one that was analyzed by the Chilean uh, Air Force for two years, couldn't figure out what it was. They released the video and I and a few other people uh, identified exactly what it was. It's just a plane in the distance leaving a contrail and we identified the exact plane. And then there's one called Rubber Duck which is probably just some balloons or a drone blowing in the wind. So the point here is that there's all this evidence, but it, uh, under scrutiny, it falls away. So, and this isn't just my opinion on these videos. This is, these conclusions are based on many hours of work over months, sometimes even years. Uh, this, for example, is a 3D recreation of a, of a path that I did in Aguadilla using manually scraped data. Took uh, a long time to do. Uh, from the gimbal video, I did this very complicated simulation that shows exactly how the camera is rotating and how the rotation correlates with the rotation of the, the object, the glare. And that took me to something that was actually did over, over several years. And it's a long video of it on my YouTube channel if you are interested in it. Uh, so we're starting to see a pattern here. A leaked video would be hyped, sometimes for quite a while. Uh, and in advance and then released. Uh, the official releases, you know, they just happen, but then people start hyping them. Then the skeptics come in and they offer some explanation. It gets rejected. We do loads and loads and loads of work. We prove exactly what it is. Uh, and then we, we prove what it is, and, but then they, they still reject it. And then the cycle repeats. We get this hype, the release, the debunk, the ignore, the conclusive debunk, more ignoring, and then they move on to the next one. Uh, and the reason for this strong pushback against these debunks is that uh, the continual investigation and the explanation of the videos means that you can't use them as evidence. So all that you're left with is this eyewitness testimony. And we know that even if the person is a highly trained professional, they can still make mistakes, uh, even if their account, uh, and their accounts cannot be checked, unlike video. With video, you can do analysis. If someone's just telling you a story, you can't do any analysis. Uh, sometimes the data itself makes things even worse. If you have data with testimony, the, the data can invalidate the eyewitness testimony. Uh, this case, for example, was uh, one brought up by Ryan Graves, one of the guys testifying. It shows some lights that he, they thought were alien craft doing a dogfight. Uh, but we did a lot of analysis on this. This is a very complicated thing. We had to geolocate it using these windmills. So we had to analyze satellite motion. Uh, we have to like, find exactly where it is. And we find these lightning storms. We do all this, this stuff. We actually tracked down the exact flight that it was filmed from. And we actually figured out exactly which satellites it actually was. It was, in fact, just a bunch of Starlink satellites flaring in the sun, uh, which is something that happens increasingly often now. So analyzing. Video evidence um, often kills the testimony. So what's next? Well, I think, unfortunately, probably more of the same. Uh, the problem is that the explanations to these videos are often complicated and have limited reach. And even when you're relying only upon eyewitness accounts, uh, the, the UFO promoters will use this appeal to authority. And they say, pilots don't make mistakes. Of course, they do. Uh, personally, I hope there will be more video evidence released. As the more we have, the more we can show. 
that the narrative of non-human intelligence being responsible doesn't really fit the facts. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a real phenomena here of ufology has got what it wished for. And you have to be careful what you wish for. You know, ufology wanted to be taken seriously, and now they are being taken seriously. And we're, we're kind of pulling back the curtain by actually analyzing these videos and having the Pentagon involved, doing proper analysis of things. And so I kind of hope things will be flushed out, but I doubt that it's going to go away. Uh, I think it'll probably carry on much as it has done for a, for a while. Uh, now, one final thing, I was a bit uncertain about the title of this talk. It was originally just called, Why is the Government Studying UFOs? But it was kind of spiced up with, you know, what's next, the men in black. I thought I was kind of like maybe mocking people a little bit. But then I saw this, this episode of a podcast um, on YouTube. There's, there's George Knapp and James Lukatsky and Colm Kelleher. All these people back from the mids and, uh, and uh, Skinwalker days are still, still around with us. And what was the topic? They were actually talking about the men in black. They actually think that the men in black is a real thing. And they were actually saying that they think that the men in black might, in fact, be aliens. So yes, I think uh, for some people, what's next actually is the men in black. So thank you very much.